historical American girl read-alouds. Today I'm going to re be reading chapter two from Meet Josefina. Next to me here I have Josefina and I've set up her courtyard with a mix of objects from American Girl from the company and some other objects that might have been in Josefina's home. A courtyard occurs in our story today. And a courtyard was an open area with no roof that was in the middle of a home or a rancho. In a moment, I'll tell you more details about Josefina's home, the rancho, what it looked like and what a courtyard is. But first, I'm gonna show you these items here. This is an outdoor oven that would have been in a courtyard and it's called an orno. It was used to bake bread. Mm -hmm. An orno was made of adobe, so it's kind of smooth on the outside. Adobe is mud that's mixed with straw, and so that's what forms the outside. Inside, a fire was built using sticks. These are official American Girl Company sticks. <laughs> so the fire was put made inside, uh, made really hot, and then there's a little hole here that the smoke could come out through. A long-handled spatula was used to put bread inside and take out of the orno. And then there was a little wooden door that could be put into place to keep the heat inside. And some other things that you would have found in the courtyard would have been goats and chickens. Some of the animals were kept inside in the courtyard to keep them safe and some plants. This book called Josefina's World, or Welcome to Josefina's World, has some great pictures of a rancho. So let's take a peek. There's a rancho. Josefina's rancho and other New Mexican homes were created out of adobe bricks. As I said earlier, adobe is mud mixed with straw and dried in the sun. It was used to make things like the orno or made into bricks. The walls of this home, like Josefina's home, were made of thick adobe bricks, which kept the home cool in the extremely hot summers and warm in the chilly winters. Josefina's home and the homes of New Mexican settlers who did not live in a village were built much like a fortress. That's kind of what you see here. In case of an attack by unfriendly Indians. Many Indians in the area were friendly and got along well with Josefina and the other next New Mexican settlers. But other tribes in the Southwest were warlike and very dangerous. So these houses were built in a square a rectangular shape around an open courtyard in the middle. The windows, as you can see in the picture here, were really small and up high for protection. They had bars over the windows as well. And there was only one door into the house, a really big heavy wooden front door. It was wide enough that it could be open to let wagons pulled by oxen in. Or if you see here, there's a little tiny door within the bigger door that could be open for people to go inside. Having just one entrance with this really big heavy door kept the people inside safe. The rancho also had a watch tower up here. The watchtower was so that they could look out and see friends or enemies coming from many miles away. It had little teeny tiny narrow windows for protection. And in our chapter today, Josefina and her sisters will look out of those windows to see someone coming. Here's a close up picture of that gate. So you can maybe see a little bit better the little door here that's inside the bigger door. And in the next picture, you'll see an inside view of the rancho with a whole lot of details. 
here you can see what I was talking about. This is the open courtyard. So this part wouldn't have a roof. All these other rooms around the outside would have roofs, but this courtyard was open with no roof. You can see in this courtyard, there's a little orno. You can see a little garden bench, chickens, a little garden here. In the chapter today, you're gonna to hear Josefina talk about a flower garden in her courtyard. And the courtyard in her rancho was almost split into two courtyards. And you'll see that in the picture in the book today. In the last picture, you saw the big heavy door leading into the house. That's this door right here. You can kind of see it from the inside now. Notice that there are no other doors leading to the outside of the rancho. Instead, all of these rooms have doors leading into the courtyard. Josefina's family would enter and exit bedrooms, sitting rooms, the kitchen, servants' rooms, and other rooms by going through the courtyard. The word for kitchen in Spanish is cocina, and today in the book you'll see a picture of Jose Josefina's cocina. Here you can also see the watchtower from the inside, how they would go inside and climb up a ladder there. A couple of other things that would be helpful to know before I start reading today's chapter. Right at the very start of this chapter, Josefina drinks from a gourd. And in case you don't know what a gourd is, it's a vegetable that was often dried and had the center scooped out. Many different Native American tribes across the whole country and New Mexican settlers and people groups all around the world used gourds because they could hold water and small ones could be used kind of as a spoon. I happen to have a gourd here, but this gourd has been made into an instrument. So this is the gourd shape here inside. Around the outside is a net that's covered with beads so that it can be shaken as an instrument. This actually came from Africa. You can see it's hollow inside and it would have been good for holding liquids, holding water and other things. Years ago, I used to teach my students about Africa and so I had this board for a really long time and I was really excited that I could share it with you today so that you can see a little bit better what a gourd looks like when you hear that in the story. Also, at the start of the chapter today, Josefina mentions um, a si siesta. In the desert environment of New Mexico where she lives, it gets really, really hot in the middle of the day. So people in both Mexico and New Mexico would get up very early in the morning while it was still cool to start their day. And then when it got really hot in the middle of the day, they would take like a midday nap or a rest and go in the inside. And then after the rest, they would go back outside to their work in the afternoon as it was beginning to get cooler. So when they mention a siesta, you'll know that, what that is. Remember in chapter one, we learned that Josefina and her three sisters were trying to run the rancho the way that their mother used to. Their mother had died a year ago, and they were all still trying to adjust to life without her. The sisters were also excited because their abuelito, their grandfather, was soon to be arriving from his long trip to Mexico City, which was down in Mexico. Abuelito had gone to Mexico City to trade goods and visit with their mother's sister, their aunt, Tia Dolores. The word Tia means aunt. The trip had taken Abuelito more than six months and the girls were eager to see him and the things that he might be bringing with him from Mexico City. So chapter two is called Abuelito's Surprise. The afternoon sun was so strong it made the ground shimmer. Josefina dipped the drinking gourd into the water jar 
and took a long drink. Like everyone else on the rancho, she was up earlier than usual after her siesta, the midday rest. Papa had heard that the caravan was not far away. It would come this afternoon. Everyone was eagerly bustling about preparing for its arrival. Josefina poured some water into her cupped hand and held it to her face, cooling first one cheek and then the other. Then she opened her hand and let the water fall on a small cluster of flowers below. Mama had planted these flowers, which grew in a protected corner of the back courtyard. Josefina's house was built around two square courtyards. The front courtyard was surrounded by rooms where Josefina and her family lived. The back courtyard was surrounded by workrooms, storerooms, and rooms for the servants. The two courtyards were connected by a narrow passageway. And so you can see there in the picture that there's almost two courtyards with that long kind of passageway sticking out in the middle. Mama, with Josefina at her side, had tended her flowers in the back courtyard with great devotion. She started them from seeds sent to her from Mexico City by her sister, Tia Dolores. Josefina remembered how pleased Mama had always been when the caravan brought her some seeds from Tia Dolores. It had always seemed like a miracle to Josefina that the small brown seeds could with water and mama's care, grow into beautiful, colorful flowers. Since mama died, Josefina had cared for the flowers by herself as best she could. Just now she sprinkled the rest of the water in the drinking gourd on them. I'm glad you remember to water your mama's flowers, Josefina. Josefina turned and saw papa. He was so tall, she had to lift her chin to look at his face. Things grew well for your mama, didn't they? Papa added. Yes, Papa, Josefina answered. Mama loved her flowers. So she did, said Papa, dipping the drinking gourd into the water jar. And I hear Florisita likes flowers too. Josefina blushed. Don't worry, said Papa. You'll stand up to Florisita when you are ready. Remember back in chapter one, Florisita had knocked Josefina over trying to get the flowers that were in her hand. Josefina grinned a little bashfully. She watched Papa drink his water. Papa's eyebrows were so thick, he looked fierce until you saw the kindness in his eyes. All the sisters were respectful and rather shy of Papa. He had always been saving of his words, but since Mama died, he'd become especially quiet. Josefina knew his silence didn't come from sternness or anger. It came from sadness. She knew because she often felt the same way. Mama used to say that Josefina and Papa were alike. They were both quiet, except with their family, but were full of ideas inside. Papa didn't have Mama's easy manner with people. It had always been Mama who remembered the names of everyone in the village, from the oldest person to the newest baby. She remembered to ask if an illness was better or how the chickens were laying. She gave advice on everything from growing squash to dying wool. Mama was well loved and well respected. She was Papa's partner. She ran the household while he ran the rancho. Josefina knew that Papa missed Mama with all his heart. Papa tipped the gourd so that the last drops of water fell on the flowers. He smiled at Josefina and then strode off out the gate towards the fields. Josefina carried the water jar to the kitchen. Oh, there you are, Josefina, said Anna. Her hands were covered with flour, so she had to use the back of her wrist to brush the sweat off her forehead. 
The heat of the cooking fires was making her face red and her hair stick out. Pots full of delicious smelling concoctions sizzled, steamed, and burbled over the fires. There was always a big fandango in the evening after the caravan arrived. Neighbors from the village, friends from the Indian Pueblo, and all the people traveling with the caravan were invited. They came to Josefina's family's house to eat and drink and sing and dance and celebrate the caravan's safe return. Mama had always known just what to do to prepare for the Fandango, but this was the first time Anna was in charge. Josefina could see that Anna was overwhelmed, even though Carmen, the cook, was helping her. Two other servants were making tortillas as quickly as they could. Francisca and Clara were helping too. They were peeling, chopping, and stirring as fast as their hands could move. Thank you for the water, said Anna. She handed Josefina a large basket. Now please go to the kitchen garden and get me some onions. I'll come too, Francisca said. We need tomatoes. The kitchen garden was just outside the back courtyard. Josefina always thought the garden looked like a blanket spread on the ground. The neat rows of fruits and vegetables and herbs made colorful stripes. The squash made a yellow stripe. The chiles made a red stripe. The pumpkins were orange, the melons were light green, and the beans were dark green. In between the rows, the earth was a dark reddish brown, thanks to the water the girls carried up from the stream every day. A stick fence, like a blanket's fringe, surrounded the garden to keep hungry animals out. The sisters were all proud of the garden. Josefina had gathered a basket full of onions when suddenly she stood up. Francisca stood up too, and the girls looked at each other. Is it? Francisca began. Shh, said Josefina, holding her finger to her lips. She tilted her head and listened hard. Yes, there it was. She could hear the rumble and squeak of wooden wheels. That meant only one thing. The caravan was coming. Francisca heard it too. The girls smiled at each other, grabbed their baskets, and ran as fast as they could back through the gate. The caravan, it's coming, they shouted. Anna, Clara, it's coming. They dropped their baskets outside the kitchen door as Clara rushed out to join them. The three girls dashed across the front courtyard and flew up the steps of the tower in the south wall. The window in the tower was narrow, so Josefina knelt and looked out the lower part. Francisca and Clara stood behind her and looked over her head. At first, all they saw was a cloud of dust stirring on the road from the village. Then the sound of the wheels grew louder and louder. Soon they heard the jingle of harnesses, dogs barking, people shouting, and the village church bell ringing. Next they saw soldiers coming over the hill with the sun glinting on the buttons and guns. Then came mule after mule. It looked like a hundred or more to Josefina. The mules were carrying heavy packs strapped to their backs. She counted 30 carts pulled by plodding oxen. The carts lumbered along on their two big wooden wheels. There were four wheeled wagons as well. And so many people, too many to count. There were muleteers, cart drivers, traders, and whole families of travelers. There were herders driving sheep, goats, and cattle. Villagers and Indians from the nearby Pueblo walked along with the caravan to welcome it. Francisca stood on tiptoe to see better. She put her hands on Josefina's shoulders. Don't you love to think about all the places the caravan has been? she asked, and all the places the things it brings come from too? Yes, said Josefina. They come from all over the world, up the 
an Eno Real right to our door. Most of the caravan stopped and set up camp midway between the village and the rancho. But many muleteers and some of the cart drivers camped closer to the house in a shady area next to the stream. Josefina saw Papa ride his horse up to one of the big four-wheeled wagons. He waved to its driver. That's Abuelito, Josefina cried. She pointed to the driver of the four-wheeled wagon. Look, Papa is greeting him. See, there he is. Francisca leaned forward. Who's that tall woman sitting next to Abuelito, she wondered aloud. She's greeting Papa as if she knows him. But Josefina and Clara had already turned away from the window. They hurried down from the tower Josefina ran to the kitchen and stuck her head in the door. Come on, she said to Anna. Papa and Abuelito are on their way up to the house. Oh dear, oh dear, fussed Anna as she wiped her hands and smoothed her hair. Oh, there's still so much to do. I'll never be ready for the Fandango. When Papa led Abuelito's big wagon up to the front gate, Josefina was the first to run out and greet it. Francisca, Clara, and Anna were close behind. Josefina thought she'd never seen a sight as wonderful as Abuelito's happy face. He handed the reins to the woman next to him and climbed down. My beautiful granddaughters, said Abuelito. He kissed them as he named them. Anna and Francisca, Clara and my little Josefina, Oh, God bless you, God bless you. It is good to see you. This was the finest trip I've ever made. Oh, the adventures, the adventures. But I am getting too old for these trips. They make me old before my time. This is my last trip, my last. Oh, Abuelito, said Francisca, taking his arm and laughing. You say that every time. Abuelito threw back his head and laughed too. Ah, but this time I mean it, he said. I brought a surprise for you. He turned and held out his hand to the tall woman on the wagon. Here she is, your Tia Dolores. She has come back to live with her mama and me in Santa Fe. Now I have no reason to go to Mexico City ever again. Josefina and her sisters looked so surprised, Papa and Abuelito laughed at them. Tia Dolores took Abuelito's hand and gracefully swung herself down from the wagon seat. Papa smiled at her. You see, Dolores, you have surprised my daughters as much as you surprised me, he said. Welcome to our home. Gracias, Tia Dolores answered. She smiled at Papa, and then she turned to the sisters. I've looked forward to this moment for a long time, she said to them. I wanted to see all of you, my dear sister's children. She spoke to each one in turn. You are very like your mama, Anna, she said. And Francisca, you've grown so tall and so beautiful. Dear Clara, you were barely three years old when I left. Do you remember? Tia Dolores took Josefina's hand in both of her own. She bent forward so that she could look closely at Josefina's face. At last I meet you, Josefina, she said. You weren't even born when I left. And look, here you are, already a lovely young girl. Tia Dolores straightened again. Her eyes were bright as she looked at all the sisters. I'm so happy to see you all. It's good to be back. The girls were still too surprised to say much, but they smiled shyly at Tia Dolores. Anna was the first to collect herself. Please, Abuelito and Tia Dolores, come inside and have a cool drink. I'm sure you're tired and thirsty. 
She led Tia Dolores inside the gate. You must excuse us, Tia Dolores, she said. We haven't prepared any place for you to sleep. Goodness, Anna, said Tia Dolores. You didn't know I was coming. I didn't know myself, really, until the last minute. I've been caring for my dear aunt in Mexico City all these years. Bless her soul. She died this past spring. It was just before Abuelito's caravan arrived. I had no reason to stay, so I joined the caravan to come home. Yes, Abuelito said to the girls, your grandmother will be so pleased. Wait till Tia, wait till Dolores and I get to Santa Fe the day after tomorrow. What a surprise, eh? Josefina could not take her eyes off Tia Dolores as everyone sat down together in the family sala. The room's thick walls and small windows kept it cool even in the heat of the afternoon. Francisco whispered, Isn't Tia Dolores' dress beautiful? Her sleeves must be the latest style from Europe. But Josefina hadn't noticed Tia Dolores' sleeves or anything else about her clothes. This is Tia Dolores, she kept thinking. This is Mama's sister. Josefina studied Tia Dolores to see if she looked like Mama. Mama had been the older of the two sisters, but Tia Dolores was much taller. She didn't have Mama's soft, rounded beauty, Josefina decided, nor her pale skin or dark, smooth hair. Everything about Tia Dolores was sharper somehow. Her hands were bigger, her face was more narrow. She had gray eyes and dark red hair that was springy. Her voice didn't sound like Mama's either. Mama's voice was high and breathy, like notes from a flute. Tia Dolores' voice had a graceful sound. It was as low and clear as notes from a harp string. But when Tia Dolores laughed, Josefina was startled. Her laugh sounded so much like Mama's. If Josefina closed her eyes, it might be Mama laughing. There was a great deal of laughter in the family sala that afternoon as Abuelito told the story of his trip. Josefina sat next to Abuelito, her arms wrapped around her knees. She was happy. It reminded her of the old days to sit with her family this way and listen to Abuelito tell about his adventures. This was the most remarkable trip I've ever had, said Abuelito. Oh, the trip to Mexico City was dull enough, but on the way home, bless my soul, what an adventure. We were in terrible danger, terrible, terrible, and your Tia Dolores saved us. Oh, but I didn't, Tia Dolores began. No, 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 my dear daughter, you did save us, said Abuelito. He turned to Papa and the girls. You see, he said, I was so glad that Dolores was going to come home with me. I finished all my business in Mexico City as quickly as I could. All went well until the day I came to Dolores' house to load up her belongings. Then the trouble began. He lowered his voice, pretending he did not want Tia Dolores to hear. I had forgotten how stubborn your Tia Dolores is. She is perhaps the most stubborn woman in the world. What did she insist that we bring? You'll never guess. Her piano! Amazed, the girls all repeated. Her piano? Yes, said Abuelito. He was pleased to have astonished them all. Such fuss and trouble. I told her it was too heavy and too big. But she said she'd sooner leave all her other belongings than her piano. So I grumbled, but I allowed the piano to be packed and loaded onto one of my wagons. We left Mexico City, and I complained about the piano every mile of the way. He shook his head. 
Your Tia Dolores never said a word. She just let me go on and on complaining. Well, then we came to Dead Man's Canyon. And do you know what happened? What? asked the girls. Thieves! cried Abuelito in a voice so loud the girls jumped. Thieves attacked the caravan! Oh, you've never seen such a fight. Shouting, sword fights, gunshots. The wagon with the piano was just behind ours. We saw two thieves climb up on it and push the driver onto the ground. Then six or seven of our men rushed over and wrestled with the two thieves trying to pull them off the wagon. With all the yelling and fighting, the oxen harnessed to that wagon were scared. They bumbled into each other trying to get away. The wagon lurched forward right to the edge of a deep gully and then crash over it fell into the gully. The girls gasped. Abuelito put his hand on his heart. God bless us and save us all. What a sound that piano made when it fell, he said. A thud, then a hollow boom that rumbled like musical thunder. It sounded like a giant had strummed all the keys in one stroke. The terrible sound bounced off the walls of Dead Man's Canyon. It seemed to grow louder with every echo. The thieves were terrified. They'd never heard such a sound in all their lives. <laughs> well, didn't they take off as, as if they were on fire? All of them ran away as fast as their thieving legs could carry them. I'll bet they are still running. Everyone laughed. Abuelito laughed most of all remembering with pleasure how frightened the thieves were. When he stopped laughing, he said, After that, I put the piano in my own wagon. I never complained again. And so you see, Dolores did save us all by insisting that we bring her piano. Well done, Dolores, said Papa. But Abuelito, said Josefina, was the piano badly hurt? Tia Dolores answered, No, child, she said. One leg is splintered and the top is scratched, but I think it will sound fine. Oh, Josefina blurted, may we see it? No, 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 said Abuelito. We had to rebuild the crate. It's too much trouble to open it up. You'll just have to come to Santa Fe sometime to hear your aunt play. Papa cleared his throat. The girls and I have never seen or heard a piano, he said. May I open the crate? I'll close it up afterward. Tia Dolores turned to Abuelito. Please, she said, I'd like the girls to hear the piano. Abuelito laughed and shrugged. Of course, my dear, of course, he said. How can I say no to you after you saved my caravan? Tia Dolores kissed him. Then she and Papa led the girls outside to the wagon. The piano was in a big wooden crate. Papa pried a few boards off the crate. Tia Dolores climbed into the wagon. She reached into the crate and pushed back the lid that protected the piano's keys. She couldn't stand up straight and she didn't have much room to move her hands, but she played a chord. And then as Papa and the four girls listened, she played a spirited tune. Josefina felt the music thrum through her whole body. It made her shiver with delight. The notes were muffled because the piano was in the wooden crate, but to Josefina, the notes sounded as beautiful as bells all chiming together in harmony. She had never heard music like the piano's music before. The notes were so full, so perfect and delicate that Josefina imagined she could almost see them as they filled the air. Josefina listened. She realized that through the music, Tia Dolores was telling them how happy she was. 
The music expressed her happiness better than words ever could, because it made all of them hearing it happy too. Josefina stood still, barely breathing, listening hard, until Tia Dolores stopped. Oh dear, said Tia Dolores, I'm afraid the piano's a little out of tune, and I'm a little out of practice. Gently, she closed the lid over the keys. Josefina wanted very much to touch the piano keys. She wanted to make the wonderful music happen herself, but she was too shy to ask Tia Dolores, so she said nothing. Gracias, Dolores, said Papa as he helped her climb down from the wagon. Oh, yes, gracias, said Ana, Francisca, and Clara. You must all come to see me in Santa Fe, said Tia Dolores, smiling. I'll play for you and show you how to play the piano yourselves. The three oldest sisters followed Tia Dolores back inside the house, but Josefina stood next to the wagon until Papa had finished closing the crate. She wanted to stay near the piano as long as she could. She knew she would never forget the way Tia Dolores' music had sounded or the way it had made her feel. When Papa was finished, he saw Josefina. You liked the piano music, didn't you? He asked. Oh, yes, Papa, answered Josefina. I didn't want Tia Dolores to stop. Papa smiled. I didn't either, he said. Well, there will be plenty of fiddle music at the Bandango tonight. You'd better go in now and get ready. The guests will be coming soon. Yes, Papa, Josefina answered. She took one last look at the piano crate, then started back inside. As she walked, she thought, I wish there were some way I could let Tia Dolores know how much I loved the piano music. I wish I could give her something in return. But what? Later, when Josefina walked into the back courtyard, she knew the answer to her question. She thought of a fine gift to give Tia Dolores. I'll give it to her during the Fandango tonight, she decided. She was pleased with her idea. She thought Tia Dolores would be pleased too. And in that little picture there, you can just see inside the piano, inside the crate. So remember that back during this time, there were no radios, there was no TV, so the only time they heard music was when people actually played it live, like at the Fandango or the party. So they'd never seen a piano before, never heard piano music before. The American Girl Company did make a piano that, to go with Josefina years ago. They don't make it anymore, so the only way you can buy it is use. But it looked like this. You can see the little lid here that opened and closed to cover the keys. So it was a much tinier keyboard than the pianos we have today and probably much smaller. I would love to have the piano to add to my Josefina collection, but it costs between $400 and $500. So that's one of the pieces I probably won't have with my Josefina collection, but is, it is a neat, a neat thing to learn about. I'd love to have a few more things to go with my Josefina collection someday, like the chili peppers and dried herbs and other kitchen items, the little, the little um, thing that they made tortillas on. So I hope to someday add to my collection. And someday I'm going to build Josefina a rancho with a courtyard in the middle, with my husband's help. One other interesting thing I'd like to share with you before I go today is that there is actually a living history museum in Santa Fe. Santa Fe is a real city in New Mexico, and there's a living history museum there which the American Girl Company used for research when they were creating the Josefina stories. They went to the museum and learned all about life back in Josefina's time in the Southwest. This museum is called El Rancho de las Golondrinas, 
Golondrina is the Spanish word for swallow, which is a type of bird. So the name of this ranch literally means the ranch of the swallow. The buildings there look like Josefina's rancho would have looked. I'll put a link to the museum's website on my YouTube channel so that you can learn more about Josefina's world and this real live rancho if you're interested. And if you're ever in Santa Fe, they give special Josefina Montoya tours at the museum. I hope I get to visit someday. Thanks for joining me today. Tune in next time when we read chapter three to find out what Josefina's special gift for Tia Dolores is.